Good afternoon and welcome to Euromed Migration Talks. I'm your host, Marco Ricorda, from the International Center for Migration and Policy Development. Today, I will be accompanied by Lina Katib, the head of the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. Lina, thank you for being with us. How are you today? Thank you for having me. It's a good day to be talking to you. Great. Uh, uh, Lina, uh, you are a, a very experienced professional in this field and I'd like to ask a few questions about uh, a very hot topic, not only today but over the past few years uh, for sure, definitely starting from the what was called the migration crisis in 2015 in the Mediterranean. So today, the migration narrative is uh, very polarized, and we can see how public discourse frequently portrays migration as out of control. Now, uh, we can see that you have conducted research on the links between politics and visual representations. Uh, in your opinion, what impact do images have on the prevailing narratives of migration and consequently the public's perception of this phenomenon? Images play a very important role in public perceptions, not just for migration, but for um, a number of uh, issues, whether political, social, economic. And that's because most people get their information from the media, uh, whether we're talking the online media, the broadcast media, uh, newspapers, uh, people are moved by images. Images capture attention uh, more than perhaps text does because they can be so immediate. And of course, when we heard about the so-called migrant crisis, it was a situation in which the media were covering flows of migrants coming into Europe quite extensively, which led to public perception that there are many more refugees and migrants coming to Europe than perhaps was the reality. And that's because the media were focusing um, on this issue as a central issue at the time. But at the same time, some political parties, especially right-wing parties um, in Europe, used these kinds of images to also rally support uh, for their own uh, platforms and political agendas, which were very much uh, against migration and which portrayed migrants as a threat to the European way of life and also to the economy in Europe and security. Um, th these kinds of discourses were also disseminated quite visually uh, through the different uh, social media platforms and media messages of these different political parties. So you both had the media and the political parties, unfortunately, contributing to what became a case of um, panic uh, in some uh, uh, circles in Europe uh, within populations that basically thought that their lifestyle was going to be under threat as a result of these migrants coming to their countries. Uh, so you, you mentioned that quite clearly that um, uh, the, the importance of, uh, well, uh, ac academia-wise to analyze uh, stigma and to analyze how certain narrative, narratives develop. Now, let's talk about what happened over the past few months. We can see that during the COVID-19 pandemic, narratives stigmatizing migrants have been detected on a pretty regular basis. And we see even more than what you just described that migration has been perceived more than ever as a threat. Now, my question to you is, do you think that these sanitary crises has actually exacerbated the discussion on migration and if so, what do you think uh, uh, is the role of uh, visual representations in this? Unfortunately, the COVID-19 crisis has made the situation worse because people started thinking that migrants uh, coming into Europe would inevitably bring with them disease. Uh, and also right-wing political parties used the crisis as a way to push for why borders should be closed. So the uh, COVID-19 crisis was basically politicized by some uh, right-wing parties in Europe. Uh, and at the same time, uh, when you have uh, uh, this uh, fear of the other that unfortunately the COVID crisis perpetuated uh, in that even in any cohesive uh, community, people started uh, looking at other human beings as potential carriers of disease. You can only imagine uh, this impact being multiplied when it comes to the unknown other in the form of a migrant 
that the media or right-wing uh, political parties represent uh, as a looming threat. Um, and a lot of uh, uh, countries um, in the Mediterranean especially uh, had measures to, uh, in a way, try to stop migrants from coming into Europe, uh, being very aware um, of the uh, politicization that I, that I just talked about, and sometimes having in place very different measures for migrants arriving, for example, by sea, than they would for other people in their countries when it comes to quarantines uh, for COVID-19, for instance. And of course, this uh, dual policy of one policy for the migrants, one policy for the residents, does not help with perceptions about these migrants in general um, within the resident population. So you mentioned the media quite a few times, uh, and I see that prior to joining academia, you have worked in broadcast journalism in Lebanon. Um, media reporting has a, a very powerful impact when it comes to the crystallization of opinions. How do you think that the coverage of migration issues uh, could be approached by media professionals in order to avoid polarization in this field? Do you actually think it's possible? It is possible. I mean, of course, I've just covered the negative side of the story, but at the same time, there is a positive side to the story, as demonstrated by some journalists who have been covering uh, rather heartwarming uh, incidents of communities coming together, of people opening their doors to those in need. I think taking a right space approach is the way forward uh, so that there is no distinction between migrant and resident and that migrants should not be uh, represented through a negative framework uh, just because they happen to uh, be foreign. I mean, <laughs> personally, I am a migrant myself. I'm someone who grew up in Lebanon and then moved to the UK um, more than 20 years ago and became a British citizen. So um, I, whenever I talk about migrants, I, I always put them myself in their shoes because this is something that I have experienced uh, moving from one country to another. Um, and I have seen examples uh, that are negative and examples that are positive. So when it comes to uh, journalism, uh, there have been some heartwarming stories. Uh, uh, for example, a Syrian refugee living in the UK who is a very well-known filmmaker volunteered as a hospital cleaner uh, during the height of the uh, COVID-19 crisis in the UK. And he has many followers on Twitter and got a lot of uh, media attention from the mainstream media who were praising uh, his contribution uh, to help uh, in this crisis. And this, I think, played a very important role in showing that these migrants can actually bring a lot to the societies that host them. And he was constantly saying how proud he is to be in the UK and how happy he is to be able to contribute back to this country that opened its door for him as a refugee. So you do see stories like that, and we have to give credit to the mainstream media and the social media when they do uh, give these stories a platform. Uh, in the project that uh, we are currently managing here from Malta, um, we basically are putting a lot of focus on success stories that, as we usually say, could help switch in the migration narrative from migration crisis to migration capital. So what are your thoughts on that? Do you think uh, it's a strategy that could work? Absolutely. I mean, um, unfortunately, the trend over the past few years, and of course here I'm, I'm speaking in general terms, uh, in Europe has been to view migrants as coming to take our jobs, coming to take our benefits. But there was a recent study that was published about population uh, uh, projections for the coming decades. And it showed that a number of countries in Europe are likely to face a severe shortage in uh, a workforce because of dwindling birth rates. And that means, according to the report, that few decades down the line, countries may start competing with one another to have migrants because they will need their skills and they will need their uh, contribution to the economy. And, and that is something that we need to think about. This short-term obsession with migrants as coming to take things away should be uh, flipped to show that these migrants come and they contribute to the cultures they're in and they may become actually quite essential and necessary 
for the economy to continue further down the line. So now is a good time to start investing in them rather than seeing them as a problem. Uh, Lina, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about cinema because you published uh, quite a few books on storytelling and on the cinematic depictions of major political issues. Uh, you explain how and why particular stories or particular themes are selected. Uh, do you think that today migration is realistically represented in cinema? I mean, there are some uh, representations that are very heartwarming and uh, some representations that are not. But I would say, generally speaking, in fiction, I am seeing in, in, in recent years a lot more understanding and sympathy than before. Uh, I wrote uh, a book which was published now a long time ago in 2006 that looked at uh, representations of the Middle East in many cinemas, including uh, Hollywood and also in the Middle East itself. And at that time, most representations of people coming from the Middle East in uh, American films were rather negative. Uh, the situation is changing today. Um, migrants are, are not represented uh, in such a stereotypical way uh, as before. I'm not saying stereotypes have completely disappeared, but we are seeing movies go beyond that. And perhaps one of the uh, examples that many people may not even think about through the framework of migration is the recent Hollywood film um, about the band Queen. Uh, Freddie Mercury, who was the lead singer uh, of Queen, was a migrant. Uh, his family uh, ran away to the UK and then became uh, British citizens. And, and yet the film does not you know, characterize him as this uh, different migrant who, who, who kind of is different to us. The film is very warm um, in its embrace of Freddie Mercury and, and, and his huge contribution to culture and, and the arts. And so, uh, yes, I, I am seeing more positive signs. And, and this is the thing. Uh, people may not have ever thought of that movie as being about the migrant, but it is. I did love that movie, I have to admit. Uh, and le le let's take um, our last question it relates to music. Uh, I understand you're very involved and outside, outside of your work in policy, you do spend your time supporting musicians from the Middle East, uh, basically uh, creating visual art and uh, pur pursuing their passion. Do you think that arts can contribute to a more balanced migration narrative? And, you know, what do arts have to say about migration? Can they tell a story via their expressions? Absolutely. And I mean, for me, the arts is just as important as uh, my other work in politics. They are both different mediums for expressing uh, messages and, and getting through to people. But the arts very often get through to people in a, in, a, in a much more subtle way, especially when they bring enjoyment and entertainment. And my work in supporting musicians is very much about that. So for example, last year, uh, a bunch of people and myself set up something called the World Metal Congress, which is an event that celebrates heavy metal music from around the world. And we invited to London uh, two people uh, from Syria, one of whom is a refugee currently residing in the Netherlands. And it was really, very heartening to see how people embrace these individuals uh, who have come from Syria that is normally associated with many negative uh, attributes, unfortunately, when it comes to migrants. And it was really clear that, uh, you know, the, the filmmaker uh, who's residing in the Netherlands, who we hosted, his name is Humber Derwish, he was very talented, very eloquent. He'd made this wonderful film um, about music in Syria that spoke to a lot of people in the audience who were watching it uh, and learned from it about how life is in Syria right now. And I'm hoping that that has contributed in an indirect way, perhaps, to their understanding of the context in which people in countries like Syria live, the difficulties they face, and perhaps this got people thinking about why a lot of these people seek a different life away from their countries of origin and hopefully increase a sense of empathy um, as a result of this uh, artistic exchange that we hosted. So definitely um, the visual arts, music, etc., can all play a very positive role in that regard. 
Lena, that was a fantastic testimony. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and your experience with us. Uh, it was definitely one of, the, one of the most interesting Euromed migration talks we have held so far. Thank you again, and uh, I invite all our followers to follow uh, Lena's work on all our social networks. Lena, bye for now. Thank you so much for having me.